the interpretation of the potential field as a topographical landscape. To start this, I want to use gravity to show the potential field is a topograph is topographical in nature. So to start this, I will use gravity to show its potential field is topographical in nature. And we want to start with an analogy. Now, suppose you are riding your bike on a flat road. Up ahead, you see a steep incline. And of course, you speed up. So I kind of envisioned something like this. So you're on your bike here and you're moving in that direction. And then right here is where you have this incline. So when I look at this, yes, you see that this is a steep incline and I have a tendency to call this the landscape mainly because the word potential in this setting can be quite hideous it should be named something else so now I have a couple questions why did you suddenly start pedaling faster? And it's because you saw the steep landscape. You saw the, you saw the steep incline and you envisioned the work you were going to do. In other words, you envisioned imaginary work. Since you are not on the incline yet. Once you're in the incline, you do work. So then I have a second question. What do you call the incline 
before you are on it. In physics language, it's the potential to do work. And this is imaginary. Because you're not there. In physics, we call this the potential field. And a lot of the times, I don't say potential field, I say the potential landscape. And here, it's the gravitational potential field. This is what is telling you what you are going to do ahead of time. This is the cause of gravitational potential energy. Once you are on this steep incline, now Real work is being done. That gets converted into gravitational potential energy. <clears throat> There are clearly two entities, the steep incline, which I call the potential field, and the bike which I will say is the object. So when I'm looking at my picture, I'm just imagining over here. I'm just going to grab this and copy this and then modify it. So if I put this right in here, so the sky is not here anymore. It's on the hill. So if I bring this up here, we can now see that we have the bike on the hill going up. So then, of course, here's the bike. And of course, here is the incline, right? Here's the second guy. Here's the that's two things. And because that's two things, now we can do work. So now, let's mathematically calculate the gravitational potential field as a topographical 
landscape. So we will calculate the gravitational potential field. as a topographical landscape. So So what we want to do here is that there's really two goals. We want to compare two different viewpoints on what's going to happen. So one is going to be a physical and two, it's going to be the potential landscape. Uh, pictures. So I'm going to start with the physical picture. And what the physical picture we're going to do here is that we're going to lift the mass. So if a mass is lifted up in a constant gravitational field, a physical representation is work being done. So I imagine I have this and this is my ground. And typically, we set the ground equal to zero. It's not required. And then we're going to lift a mass. And we're going to lift at this height right here. So you could see here is that this is going to start at state one, and it's going to go up to state two. And we're going to lift this up to some height y. Now, when I look at this thing, we clearly see that the gravitational field is going down. As a consequence, we know that we have a gravitational force, but the displacement is in the opposite direction. So from our past here, we know that motion is against the field. Therefore, there is an increase in gravitational potential energy. Let's calculate this increase. in gravitational potential energy. We do this using the work energy theorem. So the work energy theorem says that if I do work from one to two, this here is gonna be the integral of the force of gravity along some path 
And because of the dot product, I get a negative sign here, right? So this guy's about the dot product. So then, because this is a constant field, it's going to be mg, and I'm going to go from 1 to 2 dy, and clearly this will then be minus mg delta y. Now that's the work. By definition, since this is a conservative force, that must be the negative of the gravitational potential energy. In other words, I can define the gravitational potential energy as mg delta y. Now, the definition of the potential field follows the same definition of the electric potential. In other words, we can define our potential function. So we could find that this is the gravitational potential field I'm now going to define it as Vg, and this will then be the potential energy per test mass instead of a test charge. And so when we write this out, we are getting rid of the mass. So what we're doing here, as we cancel this guy out, this removes the mass of object. So in other words, there is no object here. So we can clearly see that then this here has to be g, the difference, because it's going to be y2 minus y1. But if we then use our notation that we did before, then I'm going to get gy minus zero. In other words, the potential function of gravity as a function of y is equal to gy minus zero. Now what's important to note here is that, look what's here. Everything about the source remains. There is no object because we removed the mass. So now, let's go plot this. So plotting this plotting this function delta vg gives us our second physical picture. In other words, this is the, I'm going to say that this is now the potential landscape picture. So when I plot this function here, this is what we see. We see that we have an incline. Why do we have an incline? Because the potential of gravity is gy. So when you're looking at this, 
I plot this and it's linear to y, so it has to be like this here. So when I'm looking at this thing, this is what I call the potential landscape. And you could see it's an incline. So inside of here is the forbidden region, which means no mass can be there. And you can see here is that we have a slope that tells us about the gravitational field. So what do I call this? I would call this here, this is the gravitational incline that only depends on the source because there's no objects. So this is only one thing here. So there's a lot to go through here and let's get to it. So what I'm saying here is that the shape of this curve is the topographical landscape. And you're going to see that my, my preferred choice of words is that this is the potential landscape. And sometimes I will just drop the word potential and just say landscape. Now, I think that's a better word than the potential function because too many people mix up potential gravity, I mean, potential energy with potential. So the shape of this curve is the topographical landscape that a mass sees before it starts moving. Remember the bike analogy. Why did you speed up? You saw the potential landscape. Just like you, that's what the mass sees here. So we can clearly see here that when we start talking about this, that note, once again, there are no objects. And And um, this potential landscape is the source slash is the source of the work that will be done. So once again, from the block's viewpoint, it's at the bottom of this incline that tells the block how it's going to move 
before actual motion occurs. It's seeing imaginary work. Now, let's put this in pictures so that we can actually try to make this a little bit more physical. So here's going to be our physical picture. And then I'm going to have my potential landscape picture. So what do I see here? So I have a block. And what we see here is that this guy is then going to experience work. So I take this block and then I'm going to move it up to here. So in this physical picture here, I'm moving up and I get to my position two. So when I look at this here, there is work being done because that's the force of gravity. That's the direction of the displacement. And what typically happens here is that if this object goes up, let's say that we throw it up, then we know that eventually this thing will come back down. So what I'm seeing here, it goes up and falls back down. Now I want, I need to draw the exact same picture for the potential. So if I look at the same scenario here, what I'm seeing here is that you can see that this block is gonna go to this height right here. So now, I draw my incline. So this is my incline. And I have a block at the bottom. And then this block is going to reach all the way up to here to the top. So this is the exact same scenario. This is block one. I mean, this is state one and this two. And this guy's going up. And what we plotted was the was the uh, potential energy or, you know what? Yeah, it has to be potential energy because we have two things. So now what's happening? This guy, if it slides all the way up, eventually it's going to have to come back down. So in this image that we have, it slides up the incline and returns back to the bottom. Now, so when I'm looking at this image here, I can see here is that from the blocks viewpoint, it's at the bottom of the incline. which tells it how it is going to move before actual motion occurs. Now, it knows 
the work it has to do. And that work is, of course, the increase in gravitational potential energy. Now, what's important here is that now that we know the shape of the potential landscape, we know the shape of the potential landscape we analyze the motion using conservation of energy. So in other words, what if I was to copy this? Let me copy this and then I'll modify that to make it work. So let's, if I paste this in here, here's my potential function right in here. So let me get rid of all of this stuff. And now we know that this is the potential function here. So then the question really comes down to, if I want to get to the very top of the incline, then we say, it's going to have some initial speed. And then when it gets up to the top, we're going to say that it has zero speed. We typically call the bottom zero. We're going to say that that height right there is, you know, y2. So then conservation of energy just says this, that if I look at the initial energy state, I have this amount of kinetic energy if I want to get all the way to the top. And in this scenario here, our gravitational potential is zero. So conservation of energy then says this, that this has to be a constant. So this here is constant mechanical energy. And we can't create it or destroy it. So all it does here is it transfers. So then when it gets to the very top, we say that it has no kinetic energy. And when it gets to the top, we now have maximum gravitational potential energy. And that's what we do. And you can see here is that conservation of energy is a fairly straightforward process to do this. So now, in summary, Let's say this one more time, because this is abstract. And I figured that if I repeat myself enough, it'll start to make sense. So in summary, the potential landscape tells what a mass is going to do by seeing this landscape before It envisions the required work as well as energy transfers. They will undergo. Now, you got to admit, right? You have to admit 
this is a radical shift in thinking. Right? It's a radical shift and it's a paradigm shift. Now, we want to go apply this to the electric potential field. So now, what we're going to be looking at is that we're going to be looking at the charged parallel plates potential field. So this is what we're here for, not the gravitational. So one of the things that we could say here is a constant G field and E field have the same potential landscape. The physics of the of the fields doesn't change. Therefore, what was done with gravity transfers here too. So then I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to say as much and I'm not going to write as much. We're just going to get right to it. So what we envision here is that now we have a test charge in motion. And in this situation, here's what we're seeing. I have parallel plates. So I could imagine that I have these parallel plates here. And, and because they're parallel plates, that means here that I have a uniform potential, I mean, a uniform electric field. So when I look at my electric field here, I know that this E field here is going to have, going to be a constant. So we can label this Y1, and this plate Y2. And now I'm going to see a charge that's going to be moving upwards here. So I'm going to call this state one, and that's going to be state two. So as before, we have motion against the field. So that immediately tells us that there's going to be an increase in electrical potential energy. So just as before, let's calculate this increase. And we do this using the work energy theorem as before. So now I have the work from one to two. And then we have Y1, we typically call that the reference. So I'll set Y1 equal to zero. And then I'm gonna to go to Y2 here. You know what, I think I'm gonna change my Ys. 
I think I'm going to start with R's instead now. So I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, I'm going to set R1 equal to zero and R2, we're going to set equal to R. And now we're looking at the electric feet, the electric force. And when I, I know that the force here has to be Q times E, and then of course I'm integrating dr, which then gives us minus QE dr, but from the work energy theorem, this has to be the negative of the potential energy. In other words, this potential energy function is then going to be a positive quantity. So now I have my potential energy function. As before, we're going to use the definition of the potential field And we write this. We then say that the potential field, the electric potential field, as a function of R, is then going to be the potential energy divided by the test mass. And so when I look at this, this is what I'm seeing here. This guy is then going to be Q E r minus q zero so look what's happening here so what we're doing here is that we have removed all charges and so the only thing that's left now is that we get this function that only depends on the actual source. So what I'm saying here is that this is everything about the source remains. It's just about the source. So that means the potential represents the source and nothing else. So then as before, we have a picture. As we did before, we have two pictures. So one picture is, is we have the physical picture, right? So this is the physical picture. And a lot of the times, by the way, I should be careful. I'm going to say that this is also the electric field picture. And so... What we envision here is that we have a two parallel plates and I have a constant electric field and this charge, as we've already said here, is moving up. So as it moves up, we know it's going from one to two. Oh man, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I do not want to draw charges here. 
So I need to clean this up here. So as far as we're concerned, this is what we see. But now I want to transfer this and we want to go to the potential landscape picture. Over here, we see two parallel plates, but what's actually really being produced here? What's really being produced here is that we have an incline. So when I look at my incline, I see that I have a incline like this. And then the parallel plates now produce a potential function that now reads V equals to ER, where this is, of course, R right here. And very similar to what we did before, this is the forbidden region. And this incline has a slope equal to E, which tells us everything about the source. Now, a better picture in my mind is not to draw it this way, but to draw an effective picture. And this effective picture, I'm going to run out of space, so I'm going to move this over. Looks like this. So I'm going to copy this. Actually, I'm going to copy both of these. And I actually prefer this picture here. And so now what you're seeing here is that I have, I've separated these guys and you can see that there is an incline that goes from here to here. What I'm saying is that these two pictures are identical. This right here, I would say, is this electric incline. And the electric incline is the source. Just like the parallel plates is the source. I produce an electric field here. Now, as I go to the potential field, it looks like this here. And the thing that, that you're, what you're finding here is that this height here, I say that this is an electrical, an electric height. This electric height is what we call the potential difference. In other words, this is what we call our low potential, and this is what we call our high potential, as we'll talk about here in a moment here. So this is the change in the picture that we wanna that we wanna follow. So now that I have this picture of the source now, um, we now um, do a similar analysis of the the electric potential incline as we did with the gravitational incline. So here we go. So I'm just going to summarize the key points. So these are going to be the key points. 
So one. A test charge at the bottom of the potential incline heals slash sees the incline before before it starts moving. That is the potential landscape tells the charge tells the charge of the imaginary work it will do. So from that perspective here, we could now use from conservation of energy, we can calculate details about its motion on the potential incline. So if I come over here, let me use this guy here, and then I'm going to modify it. And I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to say, OK, I have this scenario here. And this is my electric, electrical height here. And what I'm seeing is that if I have a charge at the bottom here, and it's going to move in this potential field, I could imagine that I'm looking at something like this. I have a positive charge that's going to move up. And I'm going to call this state one, state two. So then conservation of energy then says what? Well, I have total energy is then going to be conserved. So if I look at how my energy is, I have electrical potential energy that starts at zero because we set R1 equal to zero, and then R2 is going to go up to some height. So if I compare these two, conservation of energy tells me that that has to be a constant. So no matter where it's at on the incline, we can come in and write this down. And that energy cannot change. So then, as I get to the very top, I'm now going to have all of my energy converted into electrical potential energy right here. So by knowing the potential, we could now apply conservation of energy, which we know how to do. So... Three, so there's some new language that we should address. So once again, I'm going to, I think I have this and I'm gonna modify this and I think I'm gonna make this a little bit higher just to get it a little bit clean because I'm gonna write more.
So now let's let's play with this a little bit. So now what do I know? I have an incline. Typically, the negative plate we choose as the reference. And typically, we call this zero. Zero means that this is, a lot of the times we say this is ground. And by the way, this is the exact same ground when you start talking about your, um, your wiring. And then this guy represents a low potential. Now, this is a single point. So this is actually meaningless. Now, I can come up here and I could look at this height here. And we say that this delta V here, this is what we call the height change. And if so, if we go all the way up to here, we see here is that V2 is not equal to zero because we define zero down there. And this represents the high potential. Now, when I look at this guy here, this high potential, what we say is that this guy is also meaningless. It actually means nothing. The only thing that matters here is this potential difference. Because this is connected to energy, the imaginary work, this here is meaningful. So then language-wise, we then say this, that the change in electrical height is what we define as V2 minus V1 which is this delta V here, and this is the potential difference. And this potential difference is also known as the voltage. So just by looking at this picture, okay? So if I look at this picture, I mean, what, what can we say? We're thinking about imaginary work. Just by looking at this potential landscape, It is clear what a moving charge does. In other words, look at this. If I have, so if I'm going from where? From a low to a high potential, the charge gains electrical potential energy. No, we're not doing any work. We're just looking at this. We're doing imaginary work in our head. And then if I come over here, 
And then I say, if we go from high to low potential, then the charge does what? Of course, it's going to lose electrical potential energy. That's the power right there.